The indicator for the day is cholesterol, right? So I hope you all know your uh, cholesterol measures. When the organizing committee asked me if I'd give a talk on indicators, my first thought was, seriously? <laughs> I, I thought, you know, I'm just a simple caveman economist. Your socio-ecological models confuse and scare me. And when I hear your terminology, I want to drop my iPhone and run for the caves. But then I realized, um, as I thought about this more, that there was probably a good chance that someone on the organizing committee realized that I once had a boat, and the boat was called the Indicator. And that's a credential you can't run away from. So I agreed to give this talk, even though I'm not one of these people who spends a lot of time thinking deeply about indicators and indices. And I know there are people here in the audience that do think deeply about indicators and indices. And I think this might be a good time to step out and have another chocolate croissant because I'm really focusing this talk on the rest of you, people like me who use indicators and indices because we need a quantification of the real world. We need it for different reasons. And I'll come back and talk about that. What I've seen at the many conferences I go to where people do talk about indicators and indices is they're often on really different pages. It sounds like we're talking about the same thing, and as you get deeper into the talk, you realize that we're not talking about the same thing. And in some people's talks, you realize that they start talking about indicators, and then they mean indices, and they're back to indicators, and maybe it's metrics, and now it's essential variables. So what I want to do with this talk is start our day on indicators by trying to get us all on the same page by telling you about my page and the way I think about indicators and indices. And I don't want you to agree with me, but I am hoping that if you see how I think about these things from the perspective uh, as an economist who was before that, uh, a policy analyst who was before that, an ecologist, it might help us all get on the same page. So first what I want to do is I want to see if we're all on the same page. And to do that, I want you all to take out your smartphones and your laptops and, and get connected to the internet because we're going to do a participatory exercise right now. And it's on Kahoot. So go to this website and in a second, once you're um, hooked up, we'll give you a pen. And what I want to do now is I want to go through some examples and ask you whether you think it's an index, an indicator, or something else. And then if we have time, I have a selection of um, indices and indicators, some of which are real and some of which aren't. And I just want to see what your knowledge of indicators are. So go ahead and get connected. Antoine, why don't you switch us over to Kahoot? So once you're on Kahoot.it, you will see this uh, a place to enter your pen. It's not .com, it's .it. And you'll have to put in a nickname, aha, uh -huh. success. This may be the best part of the talk. Okay, we're starting to reach some kind of stasis here. This talk would have never worked the first day, right? <laughs> but now you guys know how to get connected. Okay. Antoine, why don't we go ahead and start? Keep logging in. The password will be down here at the bottom, the game pin, okay? And we want to start with GDP. Do you think GDP is an index, an indicator, or something else? Okay. So there's not consensus, right? 
22, 12, and then six think it's something else. Okay, let's try the next one. And GDP is the world's most common indicator. We should be a consensus. How about the genuine progress indicator? Okay, indicator, well, it says it's an indicator, but 10 of you, uh, if you've looked inside the genuine progress indicator, you know it's really an index. So this gets at to whether is an index an indicator or are they really distinct? Um, and 14 of you, maybe you're saying they're both. Okay, let's try the next one. The ecological footprint. even split. The ecological footprint is an amalgam, it's an index of all sorts of different kinds of measures. Let's try carbon footprint. Okay, well, the, the carbon footprint isn't an index in, in my lexicon by any stretch because it's the same measure just for different activities that you participate in. It's your total carbon emissions. So in the world where I work, I would never call that um, an index, but clearly it's an indicator. Next. The Gini coefficient, sometimes called the Gini index. Okay, still we're not all on the same page. So the, the Gini um, coefficient is a summary statistic. It's a measure of dispersion of income. So it's a single variable, a single metric. Uh, it would be hard in, in my economic mind to think of that as an index. Next one. Okay, now we wanna see are these real or not? Wide mouths and thick lips is an indicator of strong sex drive. Okay, well, so there's a whole book written on this. Facial features as, an in, as indicators of sex drive. Unfortunately, there's almost no empirical evidence provided in the book. Okay. <laughs> Next. The Bangladeshi Butter Index as a predictor of S&P 500 performance. This is how much butter is sold in Bangladesh as a leading indicator. Well, Investopedia says it is an indicator, but it also says there's no empirical evidence for this either. Okay. Humor ability as an indicator of future mating success. Peer reviewed. If this is true, it explains everything you need to know about teenagers. Oh, you guys are smart because that was a, a paper in the American Psychology Association Journal. They, they had um, teenagers 
uh, indicate, um, uh, create captions for New Yorker cartoons, and then they had a panel review these uh, captions for their funniness, and then they asked them questions about dating. So, <laughs> uh, peer reviewed. Next, pupil dilation as an indicator of sexual orientation. No, this was uh, peer reviewed as well in PLOS One. And I'll come back to this because there was a, it was an important breakthrough in um, the literature for this particular discipline. But in fact, uh, you can use people's pupil dilation after showing them pictures of members of the same and opposite sex to determine their sexual orientation. Okay, I think that's it for Kahoot. Let's go ahead and go back to the presentation. Antoine? Oh, we are, how about that? Great, okay. Now, one of the important things in, in starting this day is to just remind ourselves why it is that we're trying to, to capture indicators in the first place and, and the idea is that the reality is a messy thing and it doesn't always lend itself to Quantification, um, the kinds of quantification that we need. Maybe we're interested in testing hypotheses about the way the world works. Maybe we want to monitor how people are performing or how um, communities are, are doing. We might need to understand what the effects of our policies are. And uh, the Ocean Health Index in its nature paper tries to make the case that we need indicators and indices simply as a way of structuring our thinking, or at least they're useful for that. So we start off with this idea that nature, in fact, is messy, and it's difficult to depict nature um, in, in a way that captures all of its uh, nuances. So we had to move beyond Margaret Mead when we want to describe communities and come up with ways of capturing nature. But recognizing that a, a full capture of nature isn't always easy to reproduce. We're not all Camille Pissarro, for instance. Um, and it's also true that we don't all see nature in the same way, or see reality, for instance, see human and socio-ecological socio systems. So some of you see this picture of Camille Pissarro, but if any of you are red-green colorblind, it looks like this to you, okay? So when we try to capture everything there is about reality, we don't see the same thing. And as a result, we've long tried to, to simplify the real world, and, and that um, is something that economists have been very good at. I don't know if you know the old joke that economists are people who look at the real world and wonder whether it works in theory. So we've been doing that for a while, and that's really where we've gotten um, our experience in, in putting together indicators. But the problem is, is if you simplify the world too much, of course, you lose that nuance, and you end up with something that's so simple that it may work in your model, but it doesn't work in real life. So all of the work that we do with indicators, the struggles that we have, the challenges are trying to find this balance between a very complicated reality and a very simple world that works for us in our models. And so I've got, have that depicted here by this sort of grayscale sketch of Pissarro. That's what we do when we, we work through these indicators and we try to find an indicator that captures reality well enough for us to discuss it in a meaningful way and yet simple enough for us to work with it in our models, to collect data over time that's meaningful. Now, yesterday you saw something that looked just like this um, in Beth's talk. She's talking about where it is that we can make breakthroughs in our understanding. But if you think about our ability to make decisions, it may follow a similar sort of pattern. That is, when we have too little information, we make bad decisions. 
and we have too much information, we make bad decisions. And this is why having 150 choices for your pension isn't necessarily a good thing. This is why if you find that small, medium-sized grocery store, it's a blessing, because the big grocery store, you can't find the cereal you want, and the small grocery store doesn't have the cereal you want. So what we try to do with indicators is find our spot. Not too complicated, because we can't make good decisions if it's too complicated. Not too simple. We're trying to find that sweet spot somewhere up there in the middle. Now, to begin this, we first have to figure out what it is that we want to measure. And this is, this is the difficult part. This is the social part of finding indicators. Okay? You've got to figure out what decision that you're making in order to understand what kind of indicators will help that decision. And we spend a lot of time trying to define the target. It's not easy. Often, we start with a, a well-defined target. That grows as people want that target to mean more and more. So we'll spend a lot of time, you should spend a lot of time uh, really understanding what you want the indicator to measure before you try to measure it. And then we have to move on to the second challenge, which is finding a metric or an indicator that really hits the target. This is the real challenge that we have because often we miss the target and then we go on and we create performance measures that aren't measuring our target anymore. We get so focused on the indicator that we start managing the indicator and not the reality. And anyone who has a boat with a GPS knows what this is like. You look at the GPS, you're driving the GPS, not the boat, right up until you hit the sandbar. Okay. Now, when we, we measure this, um, I'll call it a state right now, um, this target, this thing that we're trying to measure, we'll measure it in a given time period, and it may represent something in that time period that we care about, like well-being, for instance. It may measure um, uh, vulnerability in a time period, but it may also capture important information about other time periods. So for instance, if you watch crime shows, you know that the liver temperature of a body tells you when that person was killed. So we measured the indicator today, but it's trying to understand what happened in the past. So this is a lagging indicator. Many other indicators, though, we use to try to understand what's happening in the future. So we think about um, leading indicators. We want to know where the economy is going. And so we look at indicators. This, I think, is where we often get confused between whether we're creating an index or a model. And I'll come back to that. Because we expect our indicators to be predictors of something in the future. And they may not be. Now, I've heard in a couple of talks here the past couple of days that my indicator or my index is relative. And, and what you're saying there is that the indicator or index that you're using is intended to be comparative. There are some indicators and indices where if I tell you the metric, you know what it means. So if I say your pulse rate is near zero, you know that's bad, right? But there are lots of other indicators and indices whose absolute number is very difficult to interpret. So if I say your ocean health index score is 71, you have no idea what that means, really, okay? It, it needs to be comparative. So often we search for an indicator that we can use to compare the same state across different people, different communities, different regions, different countries. And so if we do that, the indicator has to be appropriate in all of those different places. We have to be able to collect the data, the context has to be the same, etc. Those may be very different indicators than if you try to collect data that looks at a change in state over time. So we may want to know, for instance, um, how someone is performing, how you're doing uh, in, in one period versus another period versus another period. So past performance may be indicator of future performance, although not apparently if you are a finance or investment company, because they always say past performance is no indication of future performance. But we need an indicator then that um, really works 
across all these periods. Okay. Now we need an anatomy of an, an indicator to really know what we're talking about. I wanna step back and, and talk, for instance, about whether we've got the state right. So I talked about this a little bit, but we've gotta start with this state and it has to be quantifiable, it has to be the right one. So you may have heard there is a lot of talk now in the US about grit as a good um, predictor of success in your future life. Studies been getting a lot of press. Uh, schools are talking about how do we incorporate grit into our curriculum. Well, the indicator, um, they used three different indicators to capture success. The indicators were performance at a spelling bee, your likelihood of completing uh, the summer boot camp at West Point, and grade point average. Now these are quantifiable, they are measures of success, but they're not necessarily very good indicators of the kind of success that we hope for our kids when they go to school. Okay. On top of that, the idea of grit is so idiosyncratic and difficult to measure that the authors have claimed that it defies an indicator. So while you have school systems now that are asking their teachers to instill grit, um, to improve success, we have a concept that defies an indicator and a concept that's only been tested on indicators that we consider fairly limited. And this is true, I think, of a lot of things that we set out to measure. So we have this anatomy. Uh, you're interested in the state, but a lot of times the things that you set out to measure aren't about the state at all, but about something else that's somehow connected to the state. So there are inputs to the state, things that affect the state you're interested in. There are things I will call outcomes or outputs, things that are affected by the state that you're interested in. And we, we work with this kind of linear model all the time when we think about, for instance, the DPSIR framework, or uh, if you think about vulnerability in terms of threats, sensitivity, adaptive capacity. Okay? We often set out to find an indica indicator for one part of that linear conceptual model, but we end up measuring other parts of that linear conceptual model. So I wanted to know how people that I work with thought about estuary health. I did what um, all social scientists would do, and I turned to Facebook, and I asked my 500 friends or whatever they are to give me indicators of estuary health. And I got answers like this. I said, oh yes, you know, fertilizer use, green infrastructure in the watershed upstream, those are all good indicators of estuary health. Well, they're not. They may be things that determine estuary health downstream, but they're not direct measures of estuary health. So I kept asking, and I got, well, there's also seafood-related illness. Okay. Well, seafood-related illness, if you're eating fish from the estuary, may be related to estuarine health. It could also be related to a lot of other things, like have you ever seen the size of a of a basket of seafood from Clausen's and Beaufort. That alone can cause seafood-related illness. So we've got measures here that are related to the state that we're after, but we still have missed an indicator of our state. So it was only a handful of people who suggested things like, oh, well, what about habitat coverage? Or Michael Algal abundance? Maybe it's fish assemblages. These are more direct measures of the state that we care about. Now, you've got the watershed, you've got the estuary, you've got the people who depend on the estuary, and you're likely to want indicators for all of those parts, not just because you're interested in the whole socio-ecological system, not just because you're interested in doing a model, but because you have people who manage different parts of that system. They all need to know. So when I talk about state, it could be anywhere in that chain from beginning to end. Everyone's interested in trying to capture that state in some, how, some way. Now, a lot of my work um, is, is not about fisheries, but it's about other things. And 
including water quality and um, recreational happiness and things like that. We, we usually find ourselves stuck with some proxy. You know, why the hell can't we just measure what we want? We've got to go out there and we have to measure something that um, isn't what we want. And this, is, by the way, is my fisheries slide for today. This is as close as I'm going to get to fisheries. Well, you know, it's hard to measure what we want, and it's hard for a couple of reasons. Some, sometimes you just can't go out and ask people about certain things. So for instance, in Southern California, there are a lot of little old ladies and men who go out at low tide and illegally fish for bivalves and invertebrates and things like that. And so you can't just ask people to tell me about your illegal recreational fishing. Okay? I mentioned the, the pupil dilation study earlier because there are lots and lots of places where you may be interested in changing patterns of sexual orientation but you can't ask people, so you have to turn to something else. So these researchers wanted to know if they could use pupil dilation. And I mentioned it was a big breakthrough because the previous indicator was genital arousal, which you can imagine has all sorts of volunteer bias and interviewer problems. So they said this is a major breakthrough to have pupil dilation. Now, sometimes we can't measure a state because the state we're interested in is complicated. Okay? It's a latent state. So nutrition, we can define that pretty directly. Health, uh, health is a little bit harder to define. And happiness is even more difficult to define because happiness is um, the sum of many factors and it may be difficult to measure happiness. So I'll, although I'll come back and talk about an attempt to do that. So these are latent states. And there is a whole uh, body of literature in, in the statistics world about latent variables and how latent variables combine to create a latent state and what you have to do when you're working with variables that combine to create a latent state. But we often see people going out and trying to create an index that captures a latent state without thinking carefully about the statistical relationships of the components of the index that create that latent state. Now I mentioned uh, in much of my previous work, I worked on recreation and beach water quality. And in beach water quality, what we're interested in is, is the water contaminated in a way that makes people sick? And the thing that makes you sick when you swim at a contaminated beach is viruses. But viruses are really difficult to measure. They're really tiny, and they exist in dilute quantities. And people don't understand the viruses in the water around them, and they're expensive to measure. So historically, we've turned to other proxies for water quality. And in particular, we've looked at fecal coliform and E. coliform, uh, and E. coli. Now, E. coli and, and fecal coliform are not what makes you sick normally when you get sick from swimming in contaminated water. But they represent the existence of um, something bad in the water that may be connected to human wastes. Okay? E. coli is a terrible um, predictor of sickness in epidemiological models. Okay? But it's a very good indicator. And it's a good indicator because it tells you whether your sewage treatment is working upstream and it's a good indicator because people know E. coli. Why? Because a lot of us plate E. coli in Petri dishes in high school. We've seen it grow. We think it's disgusting, okay? We hear on the news about restaurants that have been closed because of E. coli. So it's an imperfect proxy that works well because people take this information and they make decisions about this. In Southern California, we've been able to model people's beach-going behavior as a function of a number of things, and the average E. coli count that is used to create beach grades is a strong predictor. It's not the daily E. coli, it's the average E. coli. So our indicator should be average E. coli at the water site, not viruses, not the daily E. coli. So this is one of these examples that came up yesterday, you know, do you go with the, the more accurate indicator that people don't understand or the less accurate indicator that people do. It's not a model. This is a, a data 
a bit of data that people are using to make decisions. So if they don't trust the data, they're not going to use it no matter how accurate it is. Now context matters and in lots of discussions you'll hear, well, in Alaska we used this indicator or in Australia we used this indicator or in Kenya we used this indicator. And that might be great, but context is important, so we always have to kind of keep that in mind and remember when we're thinking about using different indicators, what's your context? So in putting this talk together, I talked with my research group about canaries in the coal mine. And uh, most of you, I would guess, know that canaries are a good indicator of bad air in small spaces. So it's a good indicator of um, hazards to human beings in places like coal mines, uh, caves, things like that. But many of the younger French researchers from Western France had never heard of this because there are no coal mines in Western France and there are not that many coal mines in France, period. Okay? So it's not the right indicator for um, air quality in other places uh, and, and it certainly isn't the right indicator for other kinds of hazards. Okay. So we have all these indicators and indices that we're doing, we're talking about. I just want to quickly run through what I mean by these and encourage you to define what you mean by these in your talks. Uh, the ideal is to find the single indicator that represents the state you're after. But as I mentioned, sometimes states are complicated. They could be multidimensional or latent. You have more than one um, thing you're trying to measure. If you have two different kinds of metrics with different kinds of units and you combine them somehow for me, that's an index. If you have two measures, two metrics, say your height plus your height, your weight plus your weight, and you add them up, for me, that's an aggregated indicator. It's the same metric over and over again. You're just adding it up. Now, there's a third class that has the same metric and the same units, but gives different individuals, different communities, different people, different weights. This is what stock indices do. For me, this is something more like an index than a, a straight indicator or metric, because unless I know exactly how you got those weights, I don't know what the number means. Okay? Now, since we're talking about weights, I want to just say something parenthetically. You will see all the time, including in the Ocean Health Index, a statement that says, to avoid value judgments, we didn't assign weights to any of the components. Well, I'm sorry, you just did give a value judgment, which means you think everything's equally important. It's not true, and when we conduct, create an index, we're always making value judgments. The only way you can get away from that is to empirically estimate the weights of your index. And that means you have to go out and collect data about the endpoint that you're trying to measure and see how well your index measures that. Until you do that, your index is aspirational. Now, we're hearing a lot about essential variables. I just want to point out that essential variables are not indicators or indices per se. They have two words instead of one. I think essential variables, is, uh, it's a bit cheeky. I would call them sufficient variables. Um, but the basic idea behind essential variables, the way they differ, uh, at least in the way they're developing now, is essential variables are really intended to be the minimum number of variables you need to describe a system. And to date, it's been non-human environmental systems, climate, it's been ocean systems, biodiversity. Okay? Indices and indicators have to come from the other direction. They start with policy. Now I want to talk specifically about three um, kinds of measures of well-being that are used at the national scale. The World Happiness Report is uh, an attempt by the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network to directly measure national levels of happiness. So this is a direct quantification of this latent variable happiness, and they use kind of complicated questions uh, to get at the happiness of the people they interview. Compare that to the Social Progress Index, which is really two things at once. So at its heart, it's a measure of this latent state called social progress. Do you have the things that you, we think you need to be moving um, up the chain in terms of being socially uh, enlightened nation. 
But it's aspirational in that there's this assumption that if you have those things, if you have education, if you have human rights, if you have electricity, then you will be better off. So this is an attempt to capture in a, in a very rigorous way the fundamental things that we believe contribute to well-being at a national level. And then we have the US News and World Report Best Countries Index, which is an attempt, well, it's an attempt really to sell magazines and it's entirely aspirational, which is it's made up. It is completely made up. It's a bunch of things that the authors felt um, were important to making you happy and uh, presumably to being able to start a business. So we have three different measures of welfare at the national level. And what I want to do is just look at the kinds of answers they give us. So here's some selected countries from uh, the Happiness Index, the World Happiness Index. And I found these um, results to be different than my uh, priors or my worldview. And I was particularly surprised to see that Portugal was less happy than Somalia. Bhutan, which of course is the only country with a ministry of happiness and uh, a, a national global uh, a gross happiness index only scores 84. And Brazil is way up there at the top. So this seemed to be different, um, at least than my understanding of these places. On the other hand, if you look at the social progress index, uh, well, Portugal and France rank high, Brazil is farther down, and the same thing in US News and World Report's best countries. So the question that has to be asked here is, do these other two indices do a better job of capturing national happiness, or have we constructed them because they reflect our worldview of what should, con what should um, make for happiness in a particular country? And this is what we have to ask always when we're creating these indices. Is this representing reality, or is it representing our view of reality? Now, one of the things that all of these indices have in common is they've got a lot of variables in them, okay? So the Ocean Health Index has 77 variables. The Social Progress Index has 61. Even when we just collect suites of indicators, we end up with lots and lots of variables. The, uh, the set of indicators that NOAA uses to assess um, human health and well-being in the Gulf of Mexico after the Deepwater Horizon is 100 variables. We once at NOAA had um, uh, we co compiled a set of coastal use variables. There were 88 of those. And so the question becomes, why so many variables? Well, I think there are at least four reasons why we end up with so many variables. The first is we ask our indices to do too much. So in the Ocean Health Index, for instance, they say this index can be used to raise public awareness, direct resource management, improve policy, prioritize scientific research, and then when I think about it, the paper that we recently submitted on indicators for coral reefs and global climate change probably made many of the same promises. Okay, so if you ask an index to do too much, it grows so big, it may not do what you want it to do. Another reason is we're often stuck data mining. We don't get to say what the variables are that we work with often, we just have to take what's out there and make sense of them. A third reason, and Jake touched on this, was that Often we create our indices through these consensus-based processes. And it's not just at the governmental level, but this is how we do business now at, at NCIS and CSYNC in the US and other places in France where we all sit together in a big group and lobby for our favorite variable to be included in the index. And then finally, a lot of people that come at this index creation process come at it with a modeling mentality. And they want to put in everything there that's important. Okay. So what do we do? We, we boil it all down to one number. Um, and when we do that, we end up with uh, a number that often is very difficult to discern. So e pluribus unum is a good motto if you're creating a country. Not a very good model for an index. Then we try to break our index up into sub-indices, subgroups, goals, whatever. And here's some examples from the vulnerability literature that we work in, different kinds of subgroups. Well, when we come up with these subgroups, we have to figure out how to make the subgroups and then what goes in the subgroups. And we tend to follow two different paths. 
One path is the pure statistical analysis, like principal component analysis, that really says we're going to let the numbers decide and we don't know anything about this. Okay? And the problem with that is principal and components analysis often gives you these subgroupings that don't make any sense at all. Okay? So you can't forget that you know something going into this. But on the other extreme, we have expert groups that tell us what the, the subgroups are and what should go in the subgroups. And often, we never go out and validate whether the experts were right. So we have the experts know everything, you don't need numbers. You only need numbers to illustrate your index. So we really need to move beyond that and get in the middle. And that's why I was talking about this latent um, statistical analysis. So what's the, the key? Well, someone asked yesterday, what's the right number of variables I need to be using in my system? Does anybody know what that says? No, neither do I. But it says something like this, right? Which is Occam's rule, which is you, just, you need just enough for the decision at hand and not any more. Or as the Navy said, you need to keep it simple, stupid, right? So we need to keep this in mind when we're creating our indices and we're creating our suites of indicators. We need just enough and not too much. And when we get too much, not only do we not understand what we have anymore, but we have to worry about the problem that you have the same driver affecting different subgroups, affecting different variables. So if you look at a lot of the, variabil uh, the vulnerability literature, vulnerability indices, income is the driver behind many of these factors. Well, if you have endogeneity repeated over and over in an index, it's like giving income, in this case, extra weight, because it's there over and over again. People say, well, we've only included income in our adaptive capacity subgroup. No, but all these other things. And Josh Schinner's finding that many of these things also are functions of how far you are from a major city. So you think you have independent variables, but you don't have independent variables at all. And that causes endogeneity. It causes a lot of problems when it comes to analysis. Just very quickly, here's a screen capture from the best countries where they measured, they looked at the relationship between GDP per capita and their overall ranking, and they said, see, Club for Growth was right. The more GDP you have, the better you are. Well, that's because the index was created to be based on GDP relevant measures, and it says that deep in one of the web pages. So it's very difficult to use an index as a dependent variable because it's already made up of what you thought uh, the independent variables were. Okay, very quickly, there's this term that they use in, in non North American English speaking countries called fit for purpose. Some things seem like a good idea at a time, and the world changes, and they're no longer fit for purpose. And that's the case with many indicators. So when we look at GDP, GDP was developed in 1938 by Kuznets for an economy that was basically manufacturing and resources. But over time, the economy that, in the US economy particularly, has become largely service-based. So there's the argument that GDP may not be the right indicator anymore. There's also the fact that when GDP was created, it was intended to measure output, but over time, we used it as performance of the economy, and more and more, it's seen as a measure of well-being. And we know it's a terrible measure of well-being, but if decisions are being made based on GDP as a measure of well-being, it's a problem. And we can't say, like Thomas Friedman said in the New York Times, oh, it's, but you know, it really is just about output. No, it's not. If people are using this to make decisions thinking it means well-being, we've got to do something about that. And that's the same for your indicators. Now, finally, almost finally, we keep talking about how we need to do this all together, ecological scientists, natural scientists, social scientists together. But I've heard repeatedly over the past couple of days, the first thing we need to do is figure out what the environmental indicators are, and then we'll go on to the social part. Well, we know that's not the case because often you give us environmental indicators that don't mean anything to me as an economist or as a policy decision maker. We need to do this together, okay? And you can't think that you'll do it together and somehow if you start at the same time, you'll reach consensus in the middle. And Jake proposed this idea of people coming together in a core group and then breaking off and working, working within their disciplinary and then coming back together my preference is sort of a modification of that, which is to have a, an interdisciplinary core group that works together all the time. Because to really make these indicators work together, the ecologist needs to understand why the sociologist and the economist think their indicators are important. What decisions are you making? And vice versa. And you have to do this, but it always has to be grounded 
and the discipline. So I, I like when you have the group together, you go back out, but you have to have a core group that you develop over time. Now finally, to just wrap this up, um, yesterday Beth said that models lie. Well, indicators and indices are equally deceptive. And we always have to ask ourselves whether the indicator and, or the indices um, or the index that we're using is still capturing what we think it is. Because it often looks deceptively real, and in fact, it isn't. And as I said before, we don't manage indicators, we manage reality. And so we always have to keep our indices and indicators grounded in reality. I want to thank my research team who gave me feedback on this and thank all of you for your time.